Today, we're going to talk about basic overview of machining and, and chip formation and why aluminum is the metal of choice. This is a very neat vintage uh, brochure cover of Kaiser Aluminum and the gentleman is standing in in a white product and that's alumina. There are three stages of aluminum. Bauxite is stage one and that is the most plentiful element in the crust of the earth today. Unfortunately we do not have deposits, large deposits in the United States. Primarily uh, mined in Russia, former, the former Russia, and Jamaica. Then it goes from the bauxite, which is kind of a brownish element, to this after smelting under intense amounts of electricity and temperature. It turns into this white powdery substance. So it takes four pounds of bauxite to create two pounds of alumina to create one pound of aluminum. Don't know if any of you are familiar with Dale Carnegie. He was known as quite a, a motivational speaker to the industry years ago. He has a book out called uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Very, very well known. He said in this that the, the thing that he recognized the most in interviewing sales, sales people, we'll call them, that they didn't know their product. So during his conversation with them, he was a little surprised at how much they didn't know about their product. You think about that and what does that mean to us as experts in the industry? If we go to our customers and they don't get the impression that we know about our product, we've got some trouble. They'll, they'll wait until the next guy or gal comes by and says the right words and tells them what they need to hear. So hopefully what we want to accomplish here is that we're going to talk about those things that are going to help you when you're in front of your customers and how to sell. Aluminum, the metal of choice. I'm a little biased because I sell aluminum, but I honestly believe that in many ways it is the metal of choice because of all of these reasons. We're not going to touch on all of them, but we'll touch on a few. Lightweight, at approximately one third of steel, but very strong, and it remains very attractive. Whereas with steel, initially it starts out sometimes rusty or has a little bit of a scale on it. It takes quite a bit of processing to remove that. You put a nice coat of paint on it, and then a few years later, it rusts. Aluminum won't do that, obviously. Second highest volume metal bought on the earth today. So if you think about metal transactions, the most significant is steel, the second is aluminum. That's pretty impressive when you think about it. Back in the 60s, aluminum was a known product, but not as widely known as steel. So it really has come a long ways in all those years. Corrosion resistant, does not rust, does not have a rusty um, reddish look to it when it's, when it's decaying or when it's corroding. Electrically conductive, a lot of the high voltage power lines that energize our cities, our homes, are out of aluminum wire. Very pure aluminum wire. Why? Because the electrical current travels to that wire almost unrestricted, unlike any other product. And it's readily available. Nog magnetic, if you think about <coughs> that expression, you think about when you're fueling up your car at the, at the gas station, the nozzle that you take off of the pump is aluminum. Usually the opening for your fuel tank is aluminum they won't create a spark, which we know is <laughs> very important. Reflective, highly suitable for light fixtures. I've noticed a lot of the light fixtures in this building are, uh, they do have an aluminum backing on it that reflects the light off of the fixture. Desirable natural finish, very nice finish that either can be left with a clear coat on it or with a paint or an anodized coat on it, which, which also adds to the look of the metal. Easily machines and various machining operations, obviously, 65% of the transactions on the, on the face of the earth are in 6061. When you think about aluminum grade, it's 6061. Why? We'll get into those details, the attributes of 6061, what that means. And here's one that's really important and becoming more and more important is recyclable. A statement was made some years ago by an industry leading um, producer, Alcoa, that very possibly 80% of the aluminum that was produced in the early 1900s is still in rotation in some form or another. Whether it's been turned into a pop can, a beer can, aluminum wheels for a semi-tractor trailer, whole variety of options where that metal could have ended up and will probably have another life as some other form. Here's some very simple uh, characteristics of each of these grades and I picked kind of the bigger, the bigger uh, volumes of each of these grades and we, we see the 6061 right on the top, very widely recognized for these reasons. It's an all-purpose alloy that can be heat treated, that can be machined quite easily, 
It's very strong and has good corrosion resistance as well as, again, takes, takes the finish, takes an anodized or a paint finish. You'll see it most times in truck trailer components. I think it's always interesting to be driving down the freeway and you'll have a semi-trailer drive past you, whether it's a reefer or a dry van. There's a big white aluminum strip on the side of that, that van. That's an aluminum extrusion, even though it's 48 feet or 52 feet long. That's aluminum, usually 6061. 6063, windows and doors. Commercial buildings, churches. In many ways, you can't go through a day without touching aluminum. You think about the cross members of some of the doors in these commercial buildings, that's an aluminum product. 6101, electrical conductor, great formability, used primarily in, in huge substations, power plants, again, because the uh, electrical current will flow very quickly through that metal without any restrictions. 6262, not a very recognized alloy, one that Kaiser Aluminum does not produce, but there are, other produ there are very limited producers out there of alloy. That's a leaded alloy. And the reason it has lead in it, lead and bismuth, is to improve its machinability. Very, very efficient in machining, but the lead in is a contaminant. You look at the state of California who, who bans uh, leaded uh, alloys. Here are the series of alloys. The one that we're going to focus on the most, obviously, is 6X. And you see why we picked that one, primarily in 6061. It has great attributes as far as corrosion resistance, machinability, strength and formability. If you look at that chart, you know why the 6X is the one that's most widely used. Because it has kind of the best core of all of those attributes. You have some, for example, the 2000 series has very low corrosion resistance. Machinability, it's good to excellent, but very high strength. Formability, very low. Why is it so low? Because it has such high mechanical properties. So you see the height right here in the strength, but it, it makes it very, very difficult to form. This grade and this grade are what is used primarily in the manufacture of commercial airliners. And the reason being is that they have this very high and high mechanical properties. Coincidentally, when aluminum gets cold, it gets, it gets stronger. So the higher that plane goes up, the, the higher the properties of that, that aluminum. Okay, this image is simply to, uh, a baseline of starting on what is a milling machine. I know it seems rather rudimentary, but there are some that have never seen a milling machine. They have no idea what we're talking about. So I picked this manual milling machine, very well known in the industry, manufactured by Bridgeport. It's been around for many, many, many years. You'll see some in shops today, but it's a one time off. You have an operator that stands here and is manufacturing. He's, he's milling some part one at a time. Now, the problem would be if you had 10 of these in your shop and you had just received a big contract for 5,000 pieces, exactly the same thing, you're in trouble. You're going to have a lot of variability if you try to manufacture one at a time on that mill. So, if we move forward so many years, we now have a CNC milling machine. CNC standing for computer numerically controlled. So they write programs on this keypad and they tell the tooling they have a variety of tooling on the inside of this on a turret, a tool turret. And it may have a drill, it may have an end mill, it may have a thread tap, it may have a variety of tools on there that the programmer has programmed in saying go this deep, this fast, back out, change tool, pick up the tap, drill down three inches, back up, get a new tool. All that does it by itself once that programmer completes that program. Very much unlike this. Not a, not a bad tool. Not a bad tool, but when you use the right tool for the right job, you're going to get a lot more done. This is efficiency. One operator, I've seen uh, facilities where you have one operator that runs six machining centers. You may have a project where you're required 5,000 pieces. You, program, you write the program one time, you load it into all of these machines, then the operator would have to open the doors, place the part inside the vise, make sure all the tooling in there is sharp and ready to go, shuts the doors and hits the green button, and he walks over to the next milling machine. Does the same thing, walks over to the next machine. So he's running six machines that are probably $200,000 a piece. Now the key here is that it's very likely that these machining centers could be operated lights out if you have the proper automation bolted onto the side of it. Meaning that the operator loads it up, he has all the parts ready to go for all the hours of continuous operation, checks all the cutting tools, 
he hits the green button, leaves the building, turns off the light. So a very, very efficient piece of equipment. But you got to have big business opportunities to be able to afford the financing for a piece of equipment like this one. Now I put this one in here. It's a very, it's a terrible photo, but I wanted to point out this is, but the H plus, that's a Haas. And Haas is a big customer of industrial metal supplies, as, as well as other distributors. But this piece of equipment, or this company, is seen all over the world, especially in the United States. An excellent name. They have really established themselves in the machining industry. Now we're going to move to a multi-spindle milling operation. Now each of these have a tool turret that's back behind here and has all the same tools. So when the programming requires that they do all this machining and then say they're going to drill, they back up, they pick up the drill bit, and then they come back and they drill at the same time in the same location. You see three pieces of plate here. The unique story about this plate is this is a wing component for a commercial airline. And you can see how much they've removed. This is what they call a monolithic design. And what has been found out is that prior to this generation of design, all of these little ribs were either welded, riveted, bolted, whatever in place. So you had one thin piece of plate underneath, and then all of this was fabricated onto it. This is a much stronger approach. You have a, you have a solid piece of plate that's been machined out and has all this rigidity because all that remaining metal is not welded together. It's all relative to the base, the base metal. This is an awesome approach that the airline manufacturers have taken as of the last about five years. Now, the numbers would be, I've heard this plate would start out at 300 pounds initially. Once it's all completely machined, it weighs a little over seven pounds. But the strength of it is so many exponentially times better than the fabricated components that they made previously. These are milling operations that we're going through. So we went back to kind of the mills. We're, we're progressing through. This is what one looks like in operation. Here's uh, some milling machine components. This is called a manifold. Very big in the Midwest. These would be used in hydraulic or pneumatic applications for primarily processing conveyor belt systems that have a lot of pneumatics that work it, or in large agricultural or large construction equipment, Caterpillar, John Deere, etc. Now the unique thing about this, these uh, shapes is that this might be the in, the in feed hole, the main supply hole to the manifold. Well, it's drilled down and it intersects with all of these others. So these are all being fed off of the main supply and then they're running other components off of that. So this is honeycombed with all of these holes and you can see that they have, some have shoulders where they would have an o-ring to seal it off. Some would have their deep drilled in and they would have threading down in there. So there's a lot of chance for, for burrs in there. What's important about that is you must have a metal that has high enough mechanical properties and consistent enough chemistry that you're not going to have chips inside of there that are, are long or burrs that are hanging up so when they do their final assembly it snags an o-ring and causes a leak. Very, very important. Here's another uh, uh, wing component for a commercial, and you can just see the tremendous amount of removal here. And they don't just start right here and, okay, we're removing all that and all that. They have to do it in stages. Because the problem we have with a lot of this type of machining is you remove so much metal that it wants to twist. So you can imagine the amount of time that the machine operator has gone to to fixture that piece of plate to that machining bed. Once he machines all the metal out and, un and unbolts it from that bed, it wants to twist. Another key component of certain metals is that you must have very consistent chemistries, very consistent heat treatment, very consistent mechanical properties to ensure that once you unbolt that from that fixture, it doesn't twist, because then that creates rework. Then the operator's got to spend a tremendous amount of time to fixture it back onto the bed of the milling center, do all the measurements, make sure he can machine a conforming part. That's time wasted. Here's an example of some chips in a, a CNC machine, machining center. This was cut by what's known as a fly cutter. It's a very large diameter. It has multiple cutting inserts on it. Um, that kind of process doesn't really generate problems with a chip. Here's another, uh, another photo of what you see here, two holding vices. So what the operators would do is they would place their, their pre-cut metal, I think it's two by three rectangular extruded bar. They'd put it in these vices. Obviously, they'd clear the vices off, make sure they get a good, tight grip on that metal. Operator would shut the door and hit the green button, and, it, and the programming takes over. And it might, it might be eight, nine minutes, and machines completely those two pieces. So productivity is very, very important. This is a, this is a very poor picture 
of an end mill that's traveling this direction is going across it, and it's only probably about a half inch or five eighths of an inch in diameter. It has cutters and all on the bottom of it, but it also has cutters on the flutes of it, just like a drill bit. So if that operator wanted, he could bring that right down the side of that metal and cut along the side of it as well. This is coolant, obviously, to keep it very cool, and you can see the very small chip formation, which is very, very important. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move on to turning operations or operations on lathe. Another very grainy picture, but I want to start at a baseline when we talk about manual turning center or engine lathe. What does that mean? Well, many, many, many years ago, a lathe such as this one, very similar to this one, would have an engine on it, whether it would be a steam engine or a gasoline engine, and that's what would run this um, chuck. So that has jaws that secure the stock that's put in there, the raw material. This is the tool post that holds a it would hold a drill bit or an insert, a ceramic insert, or a variety of tools, and then the operator would run it with these, these hand levers towards the turning stock and then machine that part that's in there. Again, just starting with baseline, so we get an idea of when we talk about engine lathe or manual turning center, what we're talking about. Just another example of that type of base equipment. You will find probably one of these and one of those Bridgeport manual milling centers in every shop sitting over in the corner, maybe used once a month. They're not good for high production uh, machining, but they're necessary for onesies and twosies. Now here's a great picture of a fantastic piece of equipment, a Haas turning center. The great thing about these pieces of equipment is they have multi-tool turrets. So that they might have 10 tools loaded up in each turret. So again, the operator can be multifaceted in that he puts in one stock item one raw stock item and with the programming they've already done and downloaded to the operating system he can machine a part complete in minutes. Now the good thing about some of this equipment is it has automated chip handling which is this conveyor system right here and it goes underneath here so when all the machine is going on the chips are all coming down this conveyor system up that conveyor into a bin or a container of some type. On the back end that we can't see very well would be a bar, an automated bar stock handler. So they take six foot lengths, four foot lengths, 12 foot lengths of bar, and they load up this bar feeder, and, and earlier I mentioned lights out. This is where that really comes into play. As long as they have the programming proven, they have enough coolant, machining coolant, and the machining tools are what they need to complete the part, they'll start the process, it'll machine and do what they call part off. It'll actually cut the finished machine part off, let it drop into a basket, and the machine advances the bar stock a little bit. The machine's next part parts it off, advances it. And it continues to feed this with all this bar stock that they fed this machine with. And it will run lights out for eight hours. So imagine that. You buy this machine, $200,000. It works for you when you're sleeping. It's almost like interest. And that's what a lot of the machine shops really like, is the ability of this equipment to, to function without an operator. Now here's a tool turret, and it's in a machine very much like this. And this turret has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight items on there, all differing cutting tools. And they've also been able to now energize. This right here is, a, is probably either an end mill or a drill. And this has its own power. So here's the chuck for the lathe, which, which turns, it rotates that stock around. Well, in the programming, it stopped the chuck. It brings the turret up with this energized drill and it drills a hole or a, it mills a little square right there and then it will index that chuck 90 degrees and cut another one. So it's actually a multi-functioning machining center more than just a lathe that turns. We talked earlier about chips and why are they important. These chips are long stringy chips which are undesirable. Why is that? Well they get caught on the cutting tools, they get, they get caught on the chuck they get caught on everything inside of that turning center and then eventually it creates a safety problem. So the operator has to stop the machine, open the door, not with his bare hand, not with the gloves on, but with a pair of pliers, he's got to pull all these chips off of there. The problem with that is that you have metal that's a little bit soft. I think these are chips from a drilling operation, which is always going to happen, but there are ways that you can control that. This one right here is especially bad and it causes downtime. That's the key. When they buy those machines, when they spend the money for those machines, the Haas Turning Center, they don't anticipate downtime. They want uptime 99%. They know there's going to have to be some setup time, but anytime you have to shut down for, for this long stringy chip problem, you're losing money. 
Here's another example. Again, these create sometimes what a machinist calls bird nest. And it can really start whipping around the side of that machining center and causing some damage to the equipment. Some more, this is a different operation. This is what they call part off, but again, undesirable chips. You don't want them long and stringy. This is what you want. These short, you can see they're very short, manageable. This is from a drilling operation. This is due to programming and due to mechanical properties of metal. That's how those chips, they get to a certain point and the mechanical properties are high enough in the metal that the chips will actually break off on their own. This is um, off of a machining center called a screw machine, which operates very similar to the CNC turning lathes, except they do load it up with bar stock. These things have uh, limit stops on them, and the machine goes to a certain point and it hits a limit and it does a different operation. It's very similar that it carries multi-tools, but it does one operation. It, does, it only does turning. But if you can see here, they've maintained this surface right here, which is the flat of the hex, they've eliminated one machining step there. But by turning all this other, threading, putting a chamfer on there, a little shoulder, a little, little angle right there, they've completed those parts and they can pump those parts out like uh, one every 15 seconds. And, they, and the machine shops time that. They're looking to pump out as many parts per hour as they can. And they're looking to put one operator on four machining centers. Then they really start to mac maximize their profit and their productivity. And that's the presentation.